get this out of the way. So the first talk is about uh, C-minion, symmetric encryption based on Toffoli gates over large finite fields. The paper is by Christophe Dobronik, Lorenzo Grazzi, Anna Guine, and Daniel Koister. And Daniel will give the talk. Thank you for the announcement. So hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Kuisters, and I would like to thank everyone involved in Eurocrypt for giving me the opportunity to present uh, the C-minion cipher. So again, this is joint work with Christoph Dobraunig, Lorenzo Grassi, Anna, and Anna Guiné. So as a motivation, consider the problem of uh, secure multi-party computation or MPC. Uh, here there are N parties, P1 up to Pn, and each of them has a secret input. And the goal is to compute a function of these inputs without making use of a trusted third party. And uh, each party should learn nothing apart from what can be learned from the output. And important for this talk is that there exist protocols realizing MPC in which the nonlinear non operations are much more expensive than the affine operations. So examples include uh, Yao's garbled circuit protocol with the free XOR optimization and also the GMW protocol. So suppose now that this uh, small f is actually an encryption function. So the parties want to compute an encryption function that takes a key and a plain text as input. Now, traditional symmetric ciphers, they were designed with a different computing environment in mind. So for example, uh, the chips in your laptop uh, are most likely implemented in CMOS. And in that case, an XOR gate is maybe two to three times larger than a NAND gate, but they are quite comparable. So here we are now faced with a different uh, design space. And within this space, uh, a number of uh, ciphers have been proposed and collectively they are called low multiplicative complexity ciphers. So in this table, you see a number of such proposals. Well, I don't claim that this is an exhaustive list. It's just to give you an idea. Um, and you see that some of them are defined over bits, others over FP where P is a prime or F2 to the power N. And the C minion cipher fits in right here. It's defined over both FP and F to the power N. And it is a collection of say building blocks that allows you to encrypt things. So there's a mode, uh, a permutation, a key schedule, et cetera. The motivation behind uh, the design was uh, to look at permutation-based cryptography. Now, it turns out that the key schedule that we have is quite heavy. However, if we can make the assumption that the key schedule is computed during some offline phase, which can be done in, in the two party uh, computation setting where one party has the key and the other party has the input, then it turns out that C minion is actually quite com competitive. I've tried to visualize that in this, in this figure. What you see here is on the Y axis, the number of field multiplications. And on the X axis, you see the number of, of ciphertexts that uh, are being generated. And the thing that I want to highlight here is that actually the, the, the design that, that comes closest to C minion under the assumption that the key schedule is computed offline is this Hades MIMC scheme. Now I'm going to give a, a short overview of, of some of these building blocks that I mentioned. So first of all, this is the mode. It's based on, on the Farfalle mode for those of you that know it. I would like to highlight a few things here. So there are two permutations, PC and PE. And only this PC permutation is, is needed um, to make sure that the degree of the algebraic representation is large enough. So I should say that in, in, in this kind of cipher, uh, the main threat is uh, algebraic attacks. So higher order differential attacks, uh, interpolation attacks, that kind of stuff. Uh, and this PC is, is again, making sure that uh, the degree is large enough and it's only computed once. So computed once in the sense of it does not really depend on the number of ciphertexts that are being generated. Then in the purple here, you see that we have truncated the output. So the reason for doing this is to protect against certain meet in the middle style attacks. And then here in yellow or orange, however you interpret it, uh, is the key addition, which is internal to the mode. So the reason for this is that 
uh, if it had been at the end, then you could have looked at input differences and cancel out the key addition in that way and set up systems of equations. And by moving it uh, inside, this is complicated. So the, both PC and PE make use of the same round function and the round function you see over here. Um, the nonlinear part of this round function is the multiplication and the multiplication has optimal differential and linear properties. And another nice thing is that it um, has some diffusion between the, the field elements. Whereas many of the existing uh, ciphers in this design space make use of power mappings where, which operate on only a single element. I said that affine operations are cheap, but cheap does not mean uh, completely for free. So we've opted for a relatively lightweight linear layer. And the two things that I would like to highlight here are, first of all, that we have merged the branches. And the reason for doing that is to make sure that uh, the univariate degree of a single input field element is then guaranteed to be doubled after every call to the round function. And then there's also this round constant four that you see there. And it turned out that um, if we don't have that round constant, then linear cryptanalysis is possible because then there exist linear approximations which uh, have an LP of one. So basically you can bypass this multiplication, make sure that it's not active and do that for every round uh, in the case of, a, of, of binary fields. But in this case, having that round constant, that's no longer possible. And then finally, the, the key schedule. Um, starting from a master key, the round keys are derived using a sponge construction. And the permutation used in this sponge construction is this PC. And this Im immediately shows why the key schedule is so heavy, because this PC was the one that is used to make sure that the degree is large enough. So um, it's quite heavy. That's maybe a bit of a, a downside if the key schedule needs to be implemented in an offline phase as well. So these were the, uh, this was a high level overview of the building blocks of CMinion. And we would like to encourage you to have a look at this and see if you can maybe break round reduced versions of CMinion and uh, let us know. And with this, I would like to conclude uh, this, this overview and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Do we have some uh, questions? Yeah, go on. Hello. Can you turn on the microphone? It seems to be off. I'll give you mine. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> uh, so thank you for the talk and the video. And uh, I have actually uh, two small questions. The first one is on the rolling function. So if you go to the uh, previous slide, yes. Uh, no, no, the, just the eight, eighth slide. Eight. So uh, basically what you have is just uh, a state that is running, but your PC function is a permutation. And uh, in Farfalle, you had the rolling function that is linear that guarantees that all the keys are uh, different and you have a high cycle. And uh, do you know if there is something that guarantees that the keys, uh, the run keys, are uh, at some point there is not like the short length cycles depending on the public IV. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I'm afraid I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if, if, if some properties might uh, allow you to make conclusions about that, to be honest. Okay, and the second one is uh, about meeting the middle uh, attacks. You say that you truncate the output in your uh, red uh, circle here. Yeah. Uh, do you know uh, how much can you go back in terms of runs for the PE um, function? Because when I see a run function, it's, it's very sparse. And it seems that you can go back to at least run around with one branch. And do you know how much can you go back in terms of uh, direct information you could get? So I don't know those numbers by heart, but I do know that when, when we started analyzing this PE function that indeed um, maybe against our intuition, we needed more rounds there in order to thwart these, these algebraic attacks that involve this PE. 
Um, and I don't, I don't know um, exact numbers, to be honest. Um, I think, uh, so one of my co-authors, Lorenzo, looked at this. Um, and if you're really interested in this, maybe you can have a talk with him and, and maybe he can say a little bit more about this. Thank you and nice talk also. You're welcome, thank you. Thank you, we have another uh, small question. On your slide five, you showed performance figures. And uh, it seems that we're kind of reaching a level where there's may maybe no more room for improvement compared to, to I mean, the, the improvement compared to previous construction seems to be getting smaller over iterations of new design. So do you think uh, we're close to the end or there's still something to gain? I think there are still some something to gain. In uh, the appendix of the paper, we uh, have proposed a, a slightly different version of uh, the cipher where we believe it's still secure, um, but we, we ask people to maybe have a look and see if they can do some crypt analysis for that. And we have tried to be kind of on the conservative side for this. So that's, uh, but I, I, we, we believe that there's still some room left for improvement. Yes. Thank you for the question. Okay. Thank you. Do we have questions online? Apparently no. Okay. So we'll move to the next uh, speaker and uh, thank you again. Uh, so the next, next speaker should be Azaf Rosmarin. Are you here, Azaf? Yes, do you hear me? Yeah, can you share your slides? Yes, sure. Do you see? Yes, that sounds good. So the next uh, paper is titled Mind the Middle Layer. The Hades Design Strategy Revisited by Nathan Keller and Azaf Rosmarin. And Azaf will uh, give the talk. Hey, everyone. Thanks for the introduction. So uh, I'm going to present our paper, uh, Mind the Middle Layer. So okay. I'll start with a short background for those of you who aren't familiar. Um, first, uh, the SDN design, which is a very common design for block ciphers. For example, using the AS is a round based design. In the figure, you can see one round of the AES cipher. Uh, at first, we have S boxes, which is taking every block of the state and, and applying the nonlinear function to it. Then we have the linear operation, which mixes up the blocks. And finally, we have key addition. So, PSPN, which stands for partial SPN, is a newer design applied, for example, in Zorro cipher, in which only some of the blocks <coughs> from the state go through an Xbox. And finally, the Hades design, which we consider in the paper, is a combination of the two. As you can see in the figure, the first few rounds and the last two rounds are full SPN rounds, in which all of the blocks go through an Xbox. And the middle layer is the partial SPN rounds in which only one block out of the, out of the state go through a netbox. And the reason why they do it is they use the full rounds to, another, to, to provide security against differential linear attacks and the middle rounds to provide security against algebraic attacks. Specifically, the instantiations we are considering are Poseidon and Starcast. So let's dive into the results. For Poseidon, we show how the middle layer can also be used to boost the security against um, statistical uh, attacks. And um, in the figure, you can see T is the number of blocks. There are many options for T. And S boxes in RF is the number of active S boxes provided by the author of Hades for the full rounds. And this column is the number we prove to be lower bound in the middle rounds. For example, if you look at t equals 6, t is the number of blocks, then there are 28 
active Facebook that are provided for the full rounds. And we proved there are at least 32 active Facebook that are provided in the partial rounds, which boosts the security from 28 active Facebook to 60 active Facebook And the practical meaning of this is that we can maybe reduce the number of full rounds. As the author said, their purpose is to provide security against statistical group analysis. And as it is used in MPC, as we saw in the previous talk, the main performance bottleneck is the SBOX. So reducing the full rounds is a major uh, speed up of the implementation. But after we talked to the designers, they decided to not reduce them for now as they don't know how it will affect the security of the algebraic attacks. So currently, Poseidon use, uses the same amount of the full rounds. And for Poseidon, however, uh, for Starcard, sorry, uh, the results are very different. Instead of using the middle layer to boost the security, we show that it doesn't provide any security against physical attacks. And moreover, there is a huge invariant subspace that passes the entire middle layer without activating the single left box. And what I mean by invariant is that the linear operation maps it to itself. How it can be used is by using a result from a paper by Bain et al, which appeared in crypto 2020. They showed that if hypothetically some conditions on StarCAD were to, were to happen, an algebraic parameter attack could be mounted on the cipher. Using our results, it can be shown that the conditions indeed apply and the cipher can be attacked and it sometimes even breaks the security guarantee of the cipher. The way we achieve the results is by studying a certain family of Cauchy matrices, which are used in the, in the StarCAD design. And sorry. Um, the size of the of the invariant subspace, which is the main thing we prove in the paper, is um, when t, which is the number of blocks, is s times to the power of k, or s is odd. For example, if t is 24, then s is equal to 3, and k is also, also 3. Then the dimension of the invariant subspace is at least t minus 2s which is, for example, 18 out of 24, uh, or T 24, which is indeed very high. And I want to note, in, note in the paper, it appeared as a conjecture, but since publishing the paper, we proved it. So it's actually a theorem now. And you can find in the paper, a proof of the lower bound, at a weaker bound of T minus S times K plus one. And also we have the proof for the special case for S equals one, and T is the power of two. Um, the practical impact is that um, by choosing the middle layer, the matrix of the middle layer carefully, we can dramatically boost the security against the differential linear attacks. And when not choosing it carefully, um, it, it can be used to mount even algebraic attacks on the ciphers, as we saw that happened in StarCraft. And most importantly, it is very easy to to avoid the, the invariant subspace, in this case, by simply choosing any T, which is not divisible by four. Uh, you can see from the previous slide that if T is not divisible by four, then by the bound here, the dimension is zero. So after publishing our papers, the authors um, uh, suggested not to use StarCut anymore. And if to use target anyway, always with an odd key. So the conclusion is take into consideration the middle layer and not disregard it in the security analysis. And uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions? Thank you, Isaf. So uh, we will take questions if we have some questions here in the room or in Zoom. Uh, so I, 
Nobody seems to have a question. I have a short question. Uh, you get very different yeah. results on Poseidon and Starcad. Do you think it's just bad luck that one of them is broken and not the other? Or is there some reason behind it? Maybe the, some other choice of the parameters influenced the, the choice of a linear layer or something like that? Um, so I'll say it's both. Um, it probably is bad luck because um, it happened in one and not happened in the other. So it's good that just as well not happened in the other. But there is a reason why it happened. Um, in the paper we show where uh, I mean, we prove we proved there that it happens uh, to a very wide family of matrices StarCAD they uses, and not just we didn't just find it for specific matrices, but proved it for a general class of matrices. And the proofs show why it happened, uh, but it's also bad luck because they could just as well uh, chosen another other parameters that would not make it fall in this class of uh, matrices. So uh, basically, you just need to to the matrix and check that uh, it's okay in regard to these stacks and uh, should be good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's thank ASF again and we'll move to the next talk. Mm. So the next talk is uh, Password Hashing and Preprocessing by Puya Farshim and Stefano Tesaro. And Puya will give the talk. Yes, thanks. So uh, it's joint work with uh, Stefano Tesaro. Uh, it's 5 a.m. in Seattle, so I'm giving the talk. So passwords, uh, ah, first problem. So passwords, uh, uh, Need no introduction in cryptography. They are one of the most prevalent forms of authentication online. So typically, we use hash of password instead of password itself for authentication. And sometimes we even use uh, hash of password as a secret key to encrypt data. Um, so the adversarial setting that we're going to look at in this talk is that uh, adversary attempts to uh, crack or break multiple passwords. So the adversary gets hold of a database of passwords and wants to uh, indiscriminately attack as many users as it wants. And the adversary may actually use pre-processing techniques such as rainbow tables to speed things up. So typically in this setting, the hash function is assumed to be secure in the sense that the hash function behaves like a random oracle and the adversary is going to exploit the low entropy in the human generated passwords. So the conventional wisdom here is that if you salt your passwords, so if you have a public salt and you uh, hash your password with the salt, which is publicly available, then this is going to defeat pre-processing, essentially because if these salts are distinct, it's going to lead to some sort of a domain separation for the hash function. So the adversary needs to do pre-processing for those hash functions differently. And if the salts are unpredictable, uh, then actually the hash function that you're going to use uh, is going to be unpredictable. So it's going to completely defeat pre-processing. So uh, in this paper, we basically want to formalize this and understand the security of password hashing uh, algorithms in the uh, presence of multiple instances and pre-processing. But just before going to that, just a little bit more background on this. Uh, first of all, there has been a long uh, list of uh, works on pre-processing, starting with the work of Genoa Trevisan from 2000 going to UNRU in 2007, uh, which first who first uh, proposed uh, random oracles and auxiliary information and coming to recent years with a number of works with Dodis et al and Guo et al looking at pre-processing in the classical setting as well as the quantum setting. Another uh, work which is uh, important to our work, uh, our paper is, uh, is a work by Belarus and Parton Tesaro who highlighted the need for uh, multi-instance security in password-based crypto. So just a little bit more detail on this. So the pre-processing setting looks something like this. You have an adversary A0, the pre-processing adversary, which gets the random call H and output some auxiliary info sigma. And then in the online uh, uh, setting, the adversary gets sigma and then interacts with your game G. So that's the pre-processing setting. You can upgrade any game to the setting. In the multi-instance setting, the adversary gets a bunch of hashed passwords with their salts, and its goal is to recover all of these passwords. Uh, note that this is a bit different from multi-user setting where you have multiple things and you want to uh, uh, 
recover one of the passwords safe. And the uh, hope here is that uh, uh, the adversarial effort to uh, recover all of the passwords should, uh, uh, should scale linearly with M. So it could be the case that because of the low entropy in passwords, the adversary is actually able to break one of these passwords, but you want the, uh, the effort to go up as the number of users increase. So what we do in this paper is basically we combine these two. So we look at uh, password hashing, uh, multi-instance password hashing in the uh, presence of pre-processing. -pre so without unguessability of passwords, there is no security. So uh, there is a, a basic measure of security for unguessability of passwords uh, defined in BRT, which basically says that some passwords are generated from some password distribution, then adversaries run with a test oracle, which tests whether guess password for, for a user is correct or not. And there's also a corrupt Oracle, which returns the ICE password, the password for that ICE user. And the goal of the adversary is to win all of, uh, is to uh, guess all of these. I set all these flags to be true. And the first result of the paper is that uh, we actually bound the adversarial advantage in this game in terms of the classical mean entropy of the uh, password distribution. And uh, this actually answers an open question in BRT where the authors had in a priori bound TI for the number of test queries for each in instance I, or each index I. And this is removing this, uh, this restriction is interesting because it could be the case that the adversary is actually adapting its number of uh, queries as it makes pro progress in different instances. Uh, so in the paper, we actually uh, go beyond this and we lift this unguessability of passwords to unrecover unrecoverability of hashed salted passwords. So I don't have the time to go into that, but the techniques uh, will use some combinatorics in the bit fixing random Oracle model of uh, uh, of Coretti, uh, uh, Bildes, Guo, and Steinberger. Um, so just some uh, takeaway messages. Uh, so maybe I should uh, focus on this last box here, but uh, feel, free, feel free to ask questions about the other boxes. So if you look at the case where we have large pre-processing S, and if you have some uniform salts, which is, which, uh, which is uh, the case uh, in uh, practice, you get a bound of this form. Note that the first one does not involve S, uh, the uh, pre-processing, and the second one does. But the second one also has a term of the form ML over K, where K is the uh, size of the salt space and ML is basically the number of instances that you have, number of password salt instances. And this basically says that if K is large enough, then this term is going to be small. And this is basically totally going to remove this term involving S and we are left with this. And this term has an M in the denominator, meaning that if you set to be about one, then you will see that T is equal MN, which means that uh, the adversarial effort is actually scaling with M. So this basically theoretically uh, uh, confirms this wisdom that salting defeats pre-processing. In the paper, we also propose a, uh, a composable uh, KDF notion of security in the presence of AI, auxiliary input. Uh, yeah, and we look at the case of iterating hash. Thanks very much. Thank you, Puya. Uh, do we have questions in the room or online? Yeah. On, okay. Uh, so as far as I can tell your uh, security notions are all computational. Did you look at indistinguishability too? Uh, the... Unrecoverability of passwords is comput computational, that's correct. Uh, the AI KDF security is a uh, simulation based notion of security, so it can be seen as an indistinguishability notion. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question or not. It does, thank you. Thank you, do we have other questions? So if no, we'll uh, thank Puya again and move to the next speaker. Thank you.
So the next uh, paper is about compactness of hashing modes and efficiency beyond Merkle tree. The paper is by Elena Andriva, uh, Risharaj Bhattacharya, and Arna Broy, and Arna will give a talk. Thank you for the introduction. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm gonna talk about the compactness of hashing modes and efficiency beyond Markle tree. This is a joint work as Gaetan said with Elena Andreva from TUVN, Rishiraj Bhattacharya from NICER Indian. So since it's a short talk, I will start by giving a brief overview of what we have done here. Uh, we have proposed two parallelizable hashing modes, which matches the well-known stamps bound. And we have defined a new measure for efficiency, which is called compactness. And in one of this construction, which is uh, called uh, augmented binary tree hash, we have achieved uh, almost 50% more efficiency in terms of absorbing message compared to Markov tree. And this also provides you a collision resistance mode. And in the second construction, which is almost optimal, uh, inherits all the properties from ABR. The only drawback is that it is not optimally efficient and misses one message. Um, the motivation of this work comes from one hand from the open problem um, matching the stamps bound, uh, which was proposed in 2008 and subsequently uh, the conjectures were proven. On the other hand, um, compression uh, efficient construction of compression function in general can improve the efficiency for uh, practical use cases. For example, when you are doing large file archiving using Markle type of mode of hashing or maybe in proof systems. Um, I'm sure all of you are aware of these two main modes of, or perhaps most popular modes of hashing. One is the sequential Markle Damgar, and another one is the parallelizable Markle tree mode of hashing. Um, a natural question is that, uh, what's the minimum number of function calls you have to make in order to uh, have this hashing mode? And if you look at the previous works, we are not the first one to ask this question. This question was addressed in some uh, very nice works previously. One of them is uh, Stamps result from uh, crypto and where he conjectured that um, what is the minimum number of calls required to construct such a hashing mode using smaller building blocks. And this conjecture was subsequently proved in two results. And there was a matching constructions for two n bit to n bit um, function using end-to-end -end functions. Um, so here, what we ask is that whether this general, uh, whether we can come up with a general construction which matches stamps bound, uh, in particularly by using two end-to-end -end bit functions. And um, if you if you look at k n bit to n bit functions by using n bit to uh, two end to end functions, then the question becomes in particular whether two k minus uh, three calls are efficient. And if you compare with the Markle tree, then we see the Markle tree is actually making k minus one calls in this case. Um, in order to measure whether it's efficient or not, the first thing we did was that we derived a notion called um, compactness. This is more of a measure than notion. And this was derived directly from uh, Stamps conjecture and the corresponding uh, proofs, which we call this compactness. Uh, an optimal com uh, optimally, com optimally efficient construction should have compactness one. And then we try to measure uh, the efficiency with respect to this new parameter for different construction. And in, indeed, we found out that the two end to end function, which was proposed by um, Shimpton and Stam, was optimal. But um, when we check the value for Markle Damgard or Markle tree, um, this was not having the value um, one in terms of compactness. And then uh, with the ABR and ABR plus hash, we tested uh, the value in terms of compactness. And we found out that for the first one, it achieves the optimally, uh, com optimal uh, compactness, which is one. And for the second one, it is almost optimally compact. And here you can see the value where R is in the second case, just the number of function calls you make. Um, so this is the first construction, which is optimal. This is here, the tree is only showing for three levels. Um, this can be done for uh, arbitrary level L. Uh, where L is greater than or equal to two. And this is achieved by injecting message at all levels of the tree except the leaf level. Um, and if you 
look at the efficiency in terms of how many messages it can absorb, um, you'll find out that it can almost achieve 50% more message absorption compared to Marco 3. The second construction where we lose a bit, except at the last level, um, we could add messages everywhere, uh, but this gives us uh, in return that we can achieve a stronger notion of security, which is indifferentiability. And uh, in fact, uh, when we look at the high two of this construction, um, perhaps uh, the, the idea was actually hiding behind uh, the Shimpton stem construction. If you look at the left one, this is a twin twin construction from Shimpton stem and at height two, this is uh, the construction which we actually generalized for arbitrary level, but this is just the two level um, picture, uh, which looks awfully uh, similar. And so for two level, it, it can really be thought of as a simple extension of uh, Shimpton stem construction. So to conclude, this uh, work actually introduces uh, new ideas for the construction of parallelizable hash, which uh, can as well more messages than uh, Markov three. And uh, this is the first generalized construction towards uh, solving the open problem, uh, matching the stems bound. And uh, the optimal case in terms of security uh, is actually achieved with the assumption of a random oracle. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arnab. Uh, do we have some questions for Arnab, either in the room or online? Um, I have a quick question. Uh, you're mostly looking at collision resistance, if I understand yes. properly. Yes, did, yes. Did you look at pre-image resistance? Do you know what happens? Uh, no, we, we, this is not, was not part of the paper, but uh, we looked at the collision resistance. We did not find any problem there, but this was not formally part of the paper. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question maybe? No? Okay, so let's thank Anab again, and we'll move to the next talk. Thank you. Uh, so the next two papers are about uh, leakage uh, resilient symmetric crypto. So the next talk is leakage resilient value comparison with application to message authentication. The paper is by Christoph Dobrownik and Bart Menning, and Bart will give the talk. One second. Thanks for the introduction. Wait, I'm struggling with it. Yes, um, you hear me, right? Do you hear me? Ah, okay, great, great. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So uh, Christoph was unfortunately unable to present. So originally he was in the sketch to present. Um, I will take over. Um, so typically when we prove security, we prove security in a black box model. We consider an attacker A that has access to a scheme and this attacker can make queries and then it gets responses. And that's the way we typically prove security. In practice, however, there's more going on. There's leakage. So this could be, for instance, be power consumption or any other type of leakage. And there are two main ways uh, to solve this in a practical setting. Uh, one way is uh, protection at the implementation level. There you make the implementation basically more expensive, but you prevent um, the leakage from being useful. Uh, the other alternative is uh, protection at the mode level, where you make a slightly more expensive mode, but then you need uh, simpler protection against leakage. And a typical example of protection in a mode level is SUX. And SUX is a message authentication code based on the sponge. So if you typically key the sponge, you first take the sponge and then you absorb the message. In SUX, you do it the other way around. So you absorb the message R bits at a time. And only after the last message block, you absorb the key into the state. You make one more permutation call and then you get the tag. And the trick is here that only a limited amount of data uh, in the evaluation is secret and can leak. And in fact, we proved that the leakage resilience of the scheme is guaranteed if G and P are uh, leak up to, uh, say, lambda bits of leakage. And typically, it suffices to have leakage against simple power analysis. But if you think about such a max scheme, um, it's proven leakage resilient, but how does it verify the tags? 
But the typical way of tag verification is as follows. So if the verification oracle gets its input a message and a guest tag T star, it simply recomputes the original tag and it does a value comparison. And if the values are equal, it returns one, otherwise it returns zero. Uh, but this value comparison might leak information about T. And more generally, we see that most um, Mac or AE design is centered around leakage resilience, but the stack verification is often left out of scope and is simply assumed to be protected at the implementation level. But if you already have a leakage resilience scheme um, that uses a protected primitive, like a cryptographic permutation and sucks, why can't we just reuse it for verification? And this work is about a formal analysis of leakage resilient a value comparison. In the work, we introduce a model. I will not discuss the model in this uh, shortened presentation. Uh, we introduce some schemes and some applications. Uh, so the model, I will skip it. So I would like to refer you to the full presentation or the paper. Um, but the typical way to solve this, one way to solve a scheme to do leakage resilient value comparison is what we call PVP, or permutation-based value processing. And the idea is, is basically simple. So instead of comparing the value T with the guest value T star directly, you first process them using the cryptographic permutation, you truncate, and then you compare U versus U star. In addition, there is a salt, which could be a counter, or it could be a random value coming from somewhere, uh, but many schemes have a salt available anyway. And the trick now is that indeed, this value comparison might leak information about U. However, the attacker, if the attacker learns information about you, this is basically useless information when it tries to recover T. So even if the attacker learns the value U, it does not learn T. And this way, the value that needs to be secret stays secret even under leakage, noting that this evaluation is only done once. And as a permutation-based value processing, P can be a secret permutation like AES with a secret key, or a public permutation like ASCOM. And as a matter of fact, this way of um, um, tech, or tech comparison or value comparison was already suggested, similar to a suggestion of the designers of ISAP, one of the NIST lightweight crypto candidates. Um, an alternative is that you take a tweakable permutation or typically a tweakable block cipher like Skinny, where the tag or the target value goes into in, uh, through the data path and the salt goes in via the tweak. And then the idea is the same. And this approach was used by Spook, which was also a NIST lightweight crypto competition candidate. Um, so far, so good, but you can also use it then in an application. And here we go back to SUCKS from the beginning of this presentation, where originally you would do a plain target value comparison, T versus T star. Uh, but now you glue together SUCKS and PVP. So we call it STP for SUCKS and PVP. And the tag value is then compared with T star by permuting it first. And as salt, we take the random value that comes from the end of the keyless compression of SUCKS. So it's a value known to the adversary. That's not a problem. But the cool thing of the salt is that it's sufficiently random and it randomizes the scheme and it gives a slightly higher security bound for PVP. Uh, we proved that this scheme is leakage resilient if SUCKS and PVP are leakage resilient. And note that we need different permutations here for the, the composition to work. Um, in the paper, we have well, much more going on. So we actually describe the security model in detail. Also, the slides in the full version of the slides, we give an um, um, elaborate explanation of the security model. The full security analysis is also in the paper. In the paper, we also have Hafufu, which, unlike Suxtent PVP, uses the same primitive for message authentication and for verification. Um, I would like to conclude that this value comparison, of course, plays an important role in tag verification for Mac and authenticated encryption, but there are many other applications. Uh, a typical application would be fault counter measures where you make multiple evaluations and you compare the results. And the bottom line is that you don't need extra security impl implementation um, countermeasures there, but you can use existing resources like the cryptographic implementation. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bart. Uh, do we have questions in the room or online?
There appears to be a question in Zoom chat, which I'll let you read lest I mispronounce things. Okay, so we have a question to Bart. Is there an impact on security bounds when the tag size is half of the state size? Is there an impact on the security bounds when the tag size is half the state size? Um, well, I don't know the... Um, I think you're referring to um, this construction. Um, I don't know the details, but maybe this answers your question. If you take a public permutation, n must, must be much larger than s plus t. Um, so for ASCON, you have, a, say, a 320-bit permutation. This all works fine enough. If you take a secret permutation, there is no restriction like this. So if you take AES with 128-bit state, s and t can go over the entire state, but you need to have some buffer there. I mean, if you take AS with a secret key, this key basically functions as a buffer. If you take ASCON with 320 bits of security, you need to have a buffer here and you actually need to... Oh, we're losing you, Bart. Uh, Kevin K, can you hear us? Yes, we hear you. I think Bart's connection was broken. Okay. So Ravendra, I hope this answered your question. Apparently, yes. Great. So since Bart is not here, let's thank him again and we'll move to the next talk. So the next talk is titled The Mother of All Leakages, How to Simulate Noisy Leakages via Bounded Leakage Almost for Free. Uh, the paper is by many authors, uh, Gianluca Bryan, Antonio Faonio, Maceo Obremski, Yao Ribeiro, Mark Simkin, Macei Skorsky, and Daniel Venturi. And uh, Gianluca will give the talk. Hi, thank you for the introduction. So the security analysis of cryptographic primitives typically relies on the assumption that the underlying secrets are uh, uniformly random to the eyes of the attacker. In reality, however, this assumption may be, may be simply false due to the presence of leakage. Formally, leakage is defined as a function which takes as input the uh, secret and outputs some binary string. Clearly, it is impossible to achieve uh, security against arbitrary leakage attacks because, for example, the attacker could leak the entire secret and there is no way to uh, protect against this. So um, uh, usually uh, leakage resilience is, uh, defi is uh, defined against a certain family of functions. And uh, the first and simplest model of uh, leakage is the one of bounded leakage in which the output of the leakage function is a binary string which is limited in length. So this model is simple and versatile in that it allows for uh, easy, uh, easily proving the theorems, but it, also, it is also not so realistic because uh, typical uh, leakage attacks may gather several megabytes of, inform of data. So this is captured by the stronger notion of noisy leakage in which the um, uh, output of the leakage function may be of uh, any, any arbitrary length, but uh, the leakage is somewhat noisy in the sense that uh, it only uh, contains a small amount of information about the uh, uh, original secret. So this is formalized in literature through many models, depending on how this, uh, inform this leakage information is measured. And uh, in our work, we consider all the main uh, um, OIC leakage models. In this setting, our first result is that we prove all the missing separations between all these models. So in particular, even uh, if some of them, of some of these models look similar, we prove that they are not equivalent. So here uh, we show the general picture so far and uh, motivated by this situation, we pose our, ourselves the following question. 
Can we reduce noisy leakage resilience, which is actually more realistic, to banded leakage resilience, which is easier to obtain in a general way so that we can obtain the best of both worlds? And uh, in our work, we give a positive answer to this question. And of course, we give it by defining yet another model of leakage, which we call dense leakage. Actually, dense leakage is a rather abstract and artificial notion of leakage, but it has two main advantages. The first advantage is that uh, the class of dense leakage contains all the other class of noisy leakages, uh, which we consider. And this is a great advantage because uh, then it only remains to show the re reduction from dense leakage to bonded leakage. And the second advantage is that it is uh, easier uh, to prove this reduction from dense leakage to bonded leakage. Towards this, we define the simulation paradigm, which allows us to um, uh, clearly, to formally define, uh, to formally state the theorem and uh, prove it. So in particular, we say that a family of functions is uh, simulatable with small simulation error from another family G. If for all functions f in, uh, in f, there exists a simulator which outputs a binary string which is statistically close to the one which would output the original function f. And this holds even uh, when this uh, random variable of this, when the random variable of the leakage string is coupled with the random variable of the original secret. Uh, however, the simulator only has access to a single leakage query from uh, using a single leakage function from the family G. Through this paradigm, we prove the following result. Uh, that is, in particular, that uh, the family of dense leakage is simulatable with small simulation error from the family of bounded leakage. Also, the, parameter, the main parameters of dense leakage and bounded leakage are tightly related with a, a small overhead, which is uh, negligible in almost all practical situations. So to conclude, uh, uh, I'll do a recap of what we did. We introduced the notion of dense leakage, which captures many notions of noisy leakage. Then we show that a single query of dense leakage and therefore noisy leakage can be simulated in the information theoretic setting using a single query of bounded leakage. And then in our paper, we show several applications of our uh, results. In particular, we show that any uh, cryptographic primitive which achieves leak bounded leakage resilience in the information theoretic model also achieves noisy, uh, noisy leakage resilience uh, in the information theoretic model. There is also some result in the computational setting, but uh, our, uh, yeah, we have some practical construction, or some uh, constructions uh, of uh, concrete schemes but we are missing a general theorem for uh, the, computation, uh, uh, the computational setting. So we are, our first open problem is whether it is possible to make our simulator efficient for at least for certain functions uh, of uh, certain families of noisy leakage. Then regarding the fact that we show that a single query of dense leakage is simulatable from a single query of bounded leakage, uh, we also leave it open whether it is possible to extend this result to multiple queries. Actually, we have several uh, open problems uh, left by this new notion of leakage, and we have several examples of applications in our paper. So if you are, are interested, I invite you to take a look at our paper, uh, which is on ePrint. But uh, for now, that's it, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. We have time for some questions. Hi, thank you for the presentation. So if I understood correctly, you used the dense leakage to uh, describe the noisy leakage and reduce it to bounded, bounded leakage. So are there any like constants that are too big in this reduction or like how tight is this reduction in your work? Well, the reduction is uh, quite tight. There are some hidden constants, but uh, there are, they are not too big and uh, the reductions are quite optimal. The only thing is that uh, the simulator itself is not so efficient, uh, may not be efficient for uh, the simulation uh, in the computational setting. 
But apart from this, uh, the, uh, the parameters we obtain are uh, quite tight. So we achieve almost optimality. Do, do they depend on the size of the algorithm or function you're using? Or the simulator. Well, uh, no. it depends on, uh, well, the simulator uses an algorithm which is called rejection sampling. Uh, in order to work, it needs to compute the distribution of the leakage and the distribution of the leakage given the secret. And it, is, uh, it should be able also to sample several samples from the distribution of the leakage. Uh, of the leakage. So if all these procedures can be computed uh, efficiently, and the number of samples required by the algorithm is not uh, too big, so it is polynomial, then the simulator is efficient. Okay, thank you. Thank you, are there more questions? I don't see any question online. Okay, so I guess this is the end of the session. Uh, let's uh, thank Gianluca again and all the speakers of the session. Thank you.